بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ویلکم ٹو لنڈن اسٹوڈیوز آئی ایم یور ہوسٹ عرفان ہاشمی اینڈ الانگ ود می از مسٹر نجم سیٹھی السلام علیکم سیٹھی صاحب کلبوشنز ورڈک ہیز بین اناؤنسڈ سیٹھی صاحب واٹ میڈ یو سو شیور اباؤٹ دس فار دا سمپل ریزن دیٹ وی نیو واٹ دا لا واز اٹ واز ویری کلیئر دا ایشو ریئلی واز ناٹ ویدر ہی واز اے اسپائی اور ناٹ دیٹ از فار اس ٹو ڈٹرمن دا ایشو واز ناٹ ویدر وی گیو ہیم اے فیئر ٹرائل اور وی ڈنٹ گیو ہیم اے فیئر ٹرائل ان ٹرمز آف آور لا The issue was whether he'd been, whether he was treated fairly or not, in the sense of whether he was granted his rights under the Vienna Conventions and, other, uh, and various other international treaties and laws, i.e. given consular access and so on and so forth. Uh, so I think that is what was at stake. And here it's very clear. There were 16 judges apparently and yes. on 15 of them have sided on one side and one, an ad hoc judge by the name of Mr. Gilani, um, has uh, voted against everything they've agreed on. And so, so their basic issues are, they say, first of all, please retain, do not execute him. Um, uh, keep the execution, uh, the sentence of execution in abeyance uh, first. While it is in abeyance, please kindly review uh, your judgment and you may use your own law to review it. We are not asked, saying to you, we cannot say to you what law you should uh, use and what law you shouldn't use. That's for you under your own laws. But we think that it, a review is called for and a reconsideration is called for. But they've left it to you. The rest is all, okay, you know, you should have done this and you didn't do this and you should have done this and you didn't do this. Not important. Two provisions are important. Number one, kindly review and reconsider. Uh, why? Not that we think that you had no right to, uh, to give the judgment that you gave, except that you didn't follow the certain procedures and you didn't give him his certain rights, whereby he could have defended himself better mm. uh, and so on. Uh, so therefore, kindly go over that again. Basically, this is a good judgment in the sense that both Pakistan and India can now claim a win-win situation. Pakistan can say, our judgment has not been overturned. We're simply being asked to review it. We could come, come and say the same thing all over again. Mm. So it's not as though uh, they've stopped us from, or they've in interfered in our, in our internal affairs. And so India can say, hey, we finally got consular access, and they were denying us this, and we've got it. And, and so both sides uh, can claim uh, a degree of victory. Now, the important thing is this. Why did the court come up with this judgment? Why were we all saying, ah, no problem. This is the maximum they can do. What, you see, the thing is that if the International Court of Justice starts interfering in the internal affairs and constitutional requirements of countries, then uh, they, every country will walk out of this convention. These are mutually agreed and respected procedures. Uh, where certain things cannot be challenged. If they had challenged our judgment or if they had said, you cannot execute him, you cannot, you have to free him, you have, this judgment of yours is wrong, it should not have taken place in a military court, it should have done that, then that would have been stepping into our domain. By that criterion then, they would have to step into the domain of America, they would have to step into various other domains where uh, international breaches of law can be uh, positioned. So therefore, uh, it was quite clear that the judgment would be very restricted, it would be very limited, and the court would uh, res re respect the red lines uh, under which it is constituted. It cannot go into areas where it has no right to go into. This was the maximum it could have done against Pakistan, it has done that, but the maximum is really of no consequence to us. If we now are looking for a rapprochement with India, this sets the ground for that rapprochement because no one is a loser. Both sides can claim victory and both sides can go back to the table and they can start talking about various issues. The Yadev issue was mudding the waters. We were uh, uh, bound to take a strong anti-India nationalist position. India was bound to demand certain things uh, which they uh, legitimately could not. And, uh, and so, therefore, I think uh, uh, this will clear the path for further talks uh, between Pakistan and India directly. You will recall that uh, Imran Khan um, uh, took an earlier initiative, if you recall, uh, when he returned the pilot Uh, who was downed by Pakistan. Uh, that was a unilateral decision. Uh, it helped to calm down uh, the temperatures and to bring them down. Uh, my sense is that uh, there may be in the next six months or so, 
there may be an understanding between India and Pakistan, whereby Yadev is returned to India in return for some people who are being held by India in Indian prisons, uh, alleged to be Pakistani spies and so on. So there may be a give and take. Um, and uh, there is no way Pakistan will execute Yadev. He will not be executed. He will now be provided uh, consular access and uh, the Indians will not have any complaints. This issue will die down and one day, six months or a year from now, you will find out that negotiations between India and Pakistan have led to the release of Yadev on one hand and the release of ABCD who was in Indian custody on the other. And both sides are now talking about other more substantial issues now that they've got this issue out of the way. So, sir, let's move from Hague to Islamabad. Um, FIE has arrested uh, uh, Mia Tariq Mahmood. He's the same guy who, is, who has allegedly made uh, the blackmailing video of uh, Judge Arshad Malik and his name is in the same affidavit. And uh, according to FIA, he was trying to flee to Dubai when he was arrested. So what do you think of this whole situation, <laughs> sir? This is very interesting. Tarek Mahmood, the allegation against him will be by the FIA that you made this uh, video. You, on behalf of the Nawaz Sharif family, you were blackmailing him in order to get him to uh, uh, look, look bad in the judgment that he'd given and you got him into a compromising position and um, uh, you were blackmailing him mm. uh, to support the Sharif family's case. However, judge um, uh, in the particular tape has gone on to say that he was being blackmailed by the intelligence agencies. So now the whole narrative, uh, the government will want to change the narrative from being blackmailed by the intelligence agencies uh, to give a judgment against Nawaz Sharif to being blackmailed by the Sharifs to resile from the uh, judgment that he'd given or to weaken it or to admit that he was under pressure. So uh, apparently they've t taken uh, Tariq Mahmood to uh, the magistrate where he's recorded a statement saying that he's being tortured mm. and he's being forced to make a confession which he hasn't done so far. And uh, they were compelled to do that because by law you have to produce him within 24 hours. Uh, but the thing is that so far it appears from the news reports that he has not yet admitted I, A to making the video and B obviously uh, to, 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 to charge of blackmail. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see uh, when he breaks down and what sort of statement is attributed to him, number one. Number two, uh, on the basis of a mere confession, uh, that is not sufficient evidence in any case. So they will have to find a lot of corroborative evidence. Mm. Um, and then, of course, uh, that l evidence will be put against right. his own record, his own voice, his own uh, picture on the video in which he's actually saying um, that I was blackmailed uh, by the intelligence agencies to uh, give a judgment against Nawaz Sharif. So um, uh, this is a tilt in the uh, case. Um, I don't think it will go too far uh, because the evidence of the video will always override any evidence or any affidavit given uh, either via a confessional statement or uh, by a, um, um, uh, a confessional statement before a magistrate uh, so that or the affidavit that is already given uh, which the judge has given. So my sense is that um, uh, this is harassment, uh, this is intimidation and uh, it will not really uh, go to go far uh, in addressing the issues that the government is faced with or that the judiciary is faced with. Uh, Marim tweeted at the same time after the incident that uh, and she's saying that are they going to arrest the person who actually the pictures of Hussain Nawaz? So that is another uh, question. Yes, well you see um, um, the charge against um, uh, Tariq is that you were doing something that is not allowed by law. You were videoing, you were, video, you were taking a video of a person mm. uh, in a private position without his knowledge and therefore this is uh, a cyber crime. Uh, going to be very difficult to prove that. Uh, by that criterion, all the videos that are floating around of people standing and taking videos of uh, all manner of people to talking to all manner of things, uh, the, all those will then fall under the cyber crime law. Uh, that is not going to stand. The media for, the, for one should, should, should uh, oppose it because the media is in the business of taking videos, especially <laughs> of people who don't know their videos are being taken because that's what a story is about. Uh, so, I'm, so I'm sorry this is not going to wash 
But you know, propaganda is propaganda, and uh, the FIA is an arm of the government, and uh, so they will do whatever is in their power to try and make a case or to rig a case. Um, I think uh, uh, Mariam's point is interesting. She's trying to link this with. You recall there was a video or there was a picture, picture of Hussain of Hussain Nawaz sitting in the FI in, in the NAB headquarters, I think, in Bridge GIT. before a GIT, GIT, before a GIT, and uh, looking very timid and scared and um, you know, in a solitary sort of environment. And the government um, uh, at that time uh, played it up, put it all over the place, trying to show how. Uh, he had been intimidated and how fearful he was, uh, implying in some sense that he was guilty, which is why he was afraid. And uh, that reflected badly. Uh, the aim was to make sure that Hussain or Hassan, who was it, Hassan? Hussain. Hussain was, was uh, painted in a, a bad, bad, bad color. So my sense is that um, um, that comparison is not really valid. Uh, this is altogether a different matter from that. Um, uh, the Muslim League at that time had demanded <clears throat> that uh, uh, the government or the JIT release mm. the name of the person who made that. Uh, the government it, it did not do that. Eventually, the government turned around and said that uh, we have identified who the culprit is and appropriate action has been taken. But they never made it public. Uh, they are not going to respond to Mariam on this. I don't think she is going to score any brownie points on this one. Because we're talking about uh, Mariam Nawaz, obviously. The APC has announced uh, joint rallies um, on 26th of June in Islamabad. And uh, uh, why Mariam announced her own rallies independently? Do you think she is taking a solo flight? Well, that's interesting because um, as we speak, uh, the opposition has uh, announced a strike in Karachi, uh, where all the political parties are going to be jointly doing a rally. Uh, in the meanwhile, and this I imagine is in pursuit of the earlier resolution last month that they would get together and do something. Um, Mariam, um, as you can see, Mariam uh, has always been in favor of more aggressive action. Mm. And um, uh, her frustration has been that uh, there are strong elements within her own party who want to go slow and go on to go softly. And, um, and then some of her allies, um, smaller parties. Um, also want to go slowly and then of course the People's Party also want to go slowly. So apart from Alana Fazulimaan and uh, Mariam who have been thundering and hammering away at the door and saying we got to be more aggressive, mm -hmm. um, the others are lukewarm. Uh, they want to test the waters, uh, they want to see if there is a deal on the table and so on and so forth. Um, so I think uh, what Mariam has done is that although Shabaz Sharif is the president of the party um, and in theory uh, he is supposed to announce any policy changes or policy initiatives. I think what Mariam is doing is she said, yeah, that's fine. I am uh, answerable to the head of the party, the rebel of the party, which is Nawaz Sharif. And the vote is for Nawaz Sharif and he's, I have his authority to go and meet the people. Mm -hmm. And I am simply going to be putting our case before the people. I am not in any way violating uh, party policy. So she's, as they say, pushing the envelope. She's saying, no, we've got to move on. And um, if you recall, the Jalsa in uh, Mandi Bahauddin, none of the big uh, party heavyweights. There was no Shabash Sharif. No uncles. Uh, no, no biggies, no big uncles. No <laughs> Khaja Asif, uh, no um, Shahid Khakan Abbasi, uh, no um, uh, Asin Iqbal, no Shabash Sharif, Sharif. In Mandi Bahauddin, she had her own lot. She had the younger element who always been part of her team, um, Maria Morinzeb and um, Musadat Malik and uh, uh, people from Punjab uh, who have been supporting her and mm -hmm. are pretty aggressive. Mm -hmm. So my sense is that um, Maria uh, had already said that she would go uh, to uh, Faisalabad and now she's actually announced, she said that she will be on a continuous tour. So she means to keep the political pressure on the government. And because she thinks that um, without that, uh, there will be no voice to be heard, no negotiation. And, uh, and she knows that ultimately power flows from the people. And if she can continue to demonstrate that the people are with Nawaz Sharif, that the people are with her, the softies in her party will also come under pressure. Because when they take soft positions, people don't like it. People want hard lines. People want aggression. Um, so my sense is she's uh, doing what she thinks is right. And this is an internal struggle within the party. You have some hardliners led by Nawaz Sharif, Mariam, and then her allies, 
uh, like Malana Fazal. And then there are the others who have been trying to, uh, we can't take the government on at the same time. We can't take the judges on at the same time. Right. We can't take the bureaucrats on at the same time. You know, we can't fight with NAB, we can't fight with the establishment, we can't fight with the FIA, we can't fight. <laughs> and her position is, this, yes, you can. If the people are with you, then you can take on everyone. Uh, we have the last minute and uh, I'll just quickly pick this question. Uh, Bilawal has been addressing Jalsas in FATA in the elections campaign. How effective is this? Uh, do you think this is a revival of Pakistan People's Party? I don't know whether it is a revival because the revival would not take place in the periphery of Pakistan. A revival would take place in the mainland, the, the heartland. And the heartland is Punjab. So the revival isn't taking place there. So he's going to FATA because he thinks that maybe um, it's a new area. Uh, People's Party has never made indents in that region. Uh, he is young, he is dynamic. He thinks that there are a lot of people who may have supported the PTI and Imran Khan. Uh, he thinks that maybe he can pick up a couple of seats there. I think it's a good strategy. He's a young man, he's got the energy. and um, So he's focused on targeting uh, a couple of seats in an area where he's never had any seats before. Uh, I think it's a good strategy. Uh, so, so we'll take a short break and after that we'll continue our discussion. Uh, this time for a short break, we'll be back uh, with more questions for Shadisa. Welcome back. Uh, so, Shadisa, now that the opposition has nominated Hasil Bazinjo as uh, the Senate Chairman and the government has announced, uh, has submitted a resolution against the Deputy Chairman, do you think that opposition will succeed in this? Well, you see, a little background is in order. Uh, the uh, Sherry Rahman had submitted two resolutions, uh, two notices to the chairman. One was to call a session and the other was a resolution saying we want to move in a vote of no confidence. And so both things. And uh, the Senate, under instructions obviously from somewhere, I right. tried to delay matters. They said you can't submit two resolutions at the same time. First submit a resolution for a, a meeting of the Senate and then once the meeting takes place, then put up a resolution saying you want to move a vote of no confidence. The opposition, in order to get move things faster, had done both at the same time and submitted it. So they've already wasted about 10 days mm -hmm. arguing whether A is right or B is right. Eventually, uh, the government has succeeded in delaying the issue. And uh, so now, finally, the government has said, OK, we'll accept both resolutions. So we'll call a Senate session seven days from now. And then in that Senate se session, we will have the uh, vote of no confidence. Now, originally, the idea was to have a vote of no confidence only against the chairman. But now the idea is to have a vote of no confidence against both the chairman and the deputy chairman. And the opposition feels that they need to um, change both. Earlier, Asif Zardari, uh, Asif Zardari had said that uh, he would want the Noon League to nominate somebody uh, as chairman. But I think the Noon League has decided that um, it's better not to nominate somebody from their own side, but to nominate somebody from Balochistan. Because Sanjani Saab is from Balochistan, you want to keep smaller provinces on your side, you want to show your sympathies for them, you need their votes, which are very critical. You've seen how the government was able to woo Akhtar Mengal uh, by giving him some money uh, for development and uh, not conceding any of his earlier demands. So the smaller parties are very vulnerable to inducements. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, uh, this is a crucial vote. It's entirely like, uh, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that if they hadn't given it to Hazel Vizanyu, uh, Imran Khan might have called him over and said, what do you want? And may have given him some lollipops and they would have lost three to five votes. Mm -hmm. So my mm -hmm. sense is it's a good move. Uh, to make Hazel Bizenjo. His father was a very distinguished Baloch politician, ex-governor um, of Balochistan, a, a man of great integrity and uh, highly respected. And so is his son, um, Hazel Bizenjo. Uh, good man, uh, progressive, uh, and uh, will stand by uh, uh, notions of democracy and liberalism, um, and will be an asset to both the PPP and uh, uh, the Noon League. Uh, so I think for that reason, uh, I think Mariam probably wanted uh, one of her younger lot. A um, couple of people were in the run, Musadak Malik and others, but eventually they've opted for Mr. Bizenjo, and I think it's a good choice. So that's what's going to happen. Now, the second part of your question is, will they win? Well, you know, um, the opposition says that they can put together about 60, 65 votes. If they do, well, of course, uh, they're home. Between the PPP and the Noon League, they have 50 votes. Right. So, so they need... Uh, another 10 or 12 votes. 
uh, and um, uh, they have uh, the Milli uh, Pakhtun Khwa Milli party with them. They have um, uh, Bizenjo Saab with them. They have the ANP with them. And if all come through, uh, they should be okay. They should win. However, the government is going to pull out all the stops. They are going to use everything, everything in their power to, to, to stop this from happening. And as you know, uh, other forces will step in to try and convince and arm twist certain senators to uh, uh, jump the lines. Don't forget, Irfan, the voting is secret. Right. So nobody knows who voted for whom. <laughs> so if you give somebody five crores and a little bit of arm twisting and some blackmailing, you can probably break some people from the Noon League or from the People's Party or from any of the smaller parties. So it's not by any means that the game is not over. Uh, the, the government will move heaven and earth to stop the opposition from getting its own chairman in. The Senate is very important. Right. All laws have to be ratified by the Senate. The Senate can delay things. And uh, Imran Khan, as you know, is in a hurry. And uh, loss of the Senate would also be uh, very uh, loss to his prestige. Uh, and to the carefully engineered uh, uh, arrangement that they have put together. Uh, they have the establishment with them, they have the Senate, they have the National Assembly and so on. So, uh, not a foregone conclusion. Uh, if there is horse trading, uh, Imran Khan can still thwart the opposition. But if the opposition is solid, then they should get their chairman in. We're talking about the government and um, the opposition. The temperature keeps rising every day, uh, Sir Saab, between the opposition and the government. Uh, first the arrest and now the refusal to issue production orders. Uh, what the government is trying to achieve? With yeah, this? well, you know, Irfan, government's position is very simple. No respite to the opposition. Keep them under pressure. Do not concede any of their demands. Keep them on the run. Keep them under repression uh, so that they don't have time to band together. So this is what they're doing. No production orders. The, co co the, the opposition is constantly baying for production orders so that they have more strength. And the, the, the government wants to keep as many opposition people in parliament, out of parliament, so that uh, the government has easy sailing with the, <laughs> the laws that they want to promulgate. Or indeed, some of the people who are uh, behind bars and whose production orders are not being issued are pretty aggressive people. Huh? They have the capacity to stand up in parliament and thunder away. So, uh, the government's tactics are nothing doing. Democracy can go to hell. As far as we are concerned, we are going to use these heavy-handed tactics. We are not going to look at tradition. We are not going to look at culture. We are not going to look at uh, norms and rules that have been practiced hitherto in parliament. And so, therefore, we are not going to issue production orders. The opposition has to get its act together. The opposition has to talk with the fist. If it doesn't use the fist, the government will not move. Because the government is using the fist mm -hmm. and the opposition is sort of trying to dodge it, there, dodge it there. That's not going to work. So now we move to another uh, very uh, good story and it's a developing story right now. A few days ago, the pre-arrest bail of Hafiz Said, right? And three others and today he was arrested. Is there a confusion on the part of the government? What are, what are they doing? Yes, that's a very valid question. A lot of people are asking that question. Uh, as you know, the one of the conditions um, in the FATF um, is that uh, people like Hafiz Said have to be prosecuted and put behind bars um, because they are banned and, and so on. Hafiz Said uh, earlier on um, was able to evade uh, any long-term incarceration or uh, prosecution, uh, partly because the judiciary is uh, not on board um, and secondly because at that time the establishment was not interested in prosecuting him. But what's happening now is that uh, uh, we have to show that we've done something. So, you know, we arrested him and uh, but he is entitled to bail. Now, if somebody had gone to the judges <laughs> and winked and nodded at them, they may not have given mm. bail. But uh, the thing is that there is no evidence against Hafiz Said of any act of terrorism. Uh, the world thinks that he's a terrorist, but the powers that be in Pakistan have never produced any evidence of terrorism against him. And that's the problem even today. He was released because the judge said, well, where, where's the evidence? Um, he says that he's doing social work. Has he committed a bomb? Has he planted a bomb in Pakistan? Is there any evidence that he's done something in India? And so on and so forth. No. Where is it? Well, whatever the uh, files the Indians have given, according to our people, they're insufficient. Uh, the, the footprints 
डोंट ऑल एंड अप इट हाफ सही साहब सो माई सेंस इज दैट ही वॉकड एज अ फ्री मैन एंड दैट वॉज बाउंड टू हैपन दे कैन अरेस्ट हिम फॉर थर्टी डेज ऑन द मेंटेनेंस ऑफ पब्लिक ऑर्डर दैट्स अबाउट द बेस्ट दे कैन डू दे कैन हार्ड दे आई डोंट थिंक देर इन अ पोजिशन टू कन्विक्ट हिम नाउ दैट्स बीन पार्ट ऑफ दियर प्रॉब्लम सो नाउ आफ्टर दीज बीन रिलीज द लाइवलीहुड इज दैट ऑब्वियसली अ लॉट ऑफ हेड्स विल बी शेकिंग इन दी एफ ए टी एफ सेक्रेटेरिएट एंड से आ वी टोल्ड यू दे आर स्टिल प्रोटेक्टिंग हिम एंड सो ऑन सो वॉट देव डन इज देव गॉन एंड आर अरेस्टेड हिम अगेन ऑन सम अदर प्रिटेक्सट and i dare say he'll get bail in that as well so they will take go around to fatf and say we are trying to do our best but you have not given us enough evidence to prosecute him and our courts are independent uh, we can't do anything about it so it's going to be a bit of a cat and mouse game but my sense is that uh, this will be held against pakistan and its commitment to uproot the jihadi organizations and take action i don't see that happening these are people who are long term assets uh, to undo them uh, would require a leap of faith i don't think that is available right now even with the best of intentions that okay no more jihad no more crossing borders no more supporting kashmiris and i and we can believe that because uh, it's become counterproductive now the last time something like a bomb went off there you saw what happened we almost went to war yeah. with each other Uh, so there is there is a realization but in a sense the past has handcuffed the administrations um, and you know half a said and company are not people you can shove and push um, they demonstrated their ability not just to do social work but they also demonstrated their ability uh, to garner votes uh, between them uh, they are always able to put together 5 to 8000 votes in in most constituencies in Okay, near in Punjab and Kashmir. So therefore, I'm afraid uh, um, this is not going to look good uh, in the FATA, FATA Secretariat. Uh, come September, this is going to be on the top of the agenda. Why have you not kept him behind bars? And they will say, we did put him behind bars. The courts are independent. They released him. We put him behind bars again, and so on and so forth. So this is going to be. Uh, let me ask you this yeah. question as well, sir. Sir, do you think the timing is very important because Imran Khan is going on an American visit and they want to sh- put a good show in the world that look, this is what we are doing in Absolutely. Pakistan. Absolutely. Absolutely. For Hafiz Saeed Sab to be released on the eve of Imran Khan's visit to exactly. the U.S. was an embarrassment. Okay. Now, I am sure it could have been managed that he would not have been released, but he was released. and so therefore it was important to arrest him because you certainly don't want donald trump saying ah but you got that terrorist that we banned and the united nations is banned and everybody is banned and he's a bad un- and you you know he's on the he's on the loose what have you done so, so we've got him <laughs> so but whether or not uh, they will be believed is a different question uh, it's a uh we will see that how it goes in uh, in america obviously when imran khan goes for his visit so i will take a short break and i have more questions for you regarding imran khan visit let's take a short break and put more questions when we back uh, from the break in front of sadisa welcome back sadisa now we talk about uh, the global affairs uh, as as you know that uh, Imran Khan is going to America, and that um, tour is very important for Pakistan. Uh, what Shah Mahmood Qureshi is uh, saying about that? Let's hear that first. And we have struggled with some success converting that environment of coercion to cooperation. And I can say today that from isolation we have moved towards invitation. Pakistan has welcomed. President Trump's far-sighted decision to pursue a political solution in Afghanistan, which in fact was an endorsement of our own position espoused for a long time. The U.S. contribution was helpful in diffusing the tensions post Pulwama. We hope that leadership of the two countries in Washington can agree on the imperative. of resuming a sustained and result oriented dialogue between Pakistan and India aimed at peacefully resolving all disputes 
including the core dispute of Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, Shah Mahmood Qureshi has made some assessment. How accurate he is? Yeah, yeah, he's saying a few things. He's saying, first of all, uh, there was a time that um, America was turning the screws on Pakistan um, and uh, the relationship was on the rocks. Uh, now he's saying the relationship is back on track. Um, and uh, instead of uh, saying do more, do more, we're working together, together to do As more. As a partner. Um, so they've also stepped back. He's also saying that earlier on India was pretty successful in trying to isolate Pakistan diplomatically. And he's saying now the situation has changed. Uh, instead of being isolated, we're all working together and cooperating with each other to find a way forward. Um, he's also referred to the fact that uh, uh, Pakistan and American relations are warming up and that this is augurs well for the future. Um, he referred in particularly to uh, the help behind the scenes that the Americans uh, brought to bear on the uh, on a conflict that was about to get out of hand on the Pulwama thing. Right. And uh, he's expecting that the Americans will continue to play a role in mediating conflict between India and Pakistan. Uh, so Shah Mahmood Qureshi now expects uh, cooperation between America and Pakistan to be enhanced. He thinks that um, America can play uh, uh, another, uh, uh, a role in helping Pakistan and India moved towards some sort of talks. Right. Uh, obviously, he had to mention the K-word. If you don't mention Kashmir, <laughs> then nothing gets done. Um, although I don't think the Americans will wade into the Kashmir waters. But nonetheless, for the sake of uh, making a statement, it's good. Now, the real issue is Afghanistan. Uh, that is where America and Pakistan will be working very closely together to find solutions. Uh, and I think uh, uh, the main purpose of uh, Shah Mahmood Qureshi's press conference was to um, uh, say that, look, the Prime Minister is going there, the Prime Minister is going to have a few things on his agenda, and the Americans have a few things on their agenda. And we're going to shake hands and we're going to try and move forward. Uh, there is a trust deficit and uh, between both. We don't believe much of what President Trump says. <laughs> they don't believe much of what <laughs> <laughs> our government says. Uh, both sides have been playing games with each other. So that trust deficit has to be overcome. This, the purpose of this visit is to, 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 to pick up the ball in flight at the human level. You know, the Pakistani Prime Minister is taking a, a, a picture uh, of Donald Trump, which is a flattering picture of Donald Trump, which he will present to him. Donald Trump is a vain man. Uh, the idea is that, you know, you reach out to him at some personal level um, and try and establish some uh, rapport uh, so that trust can be built. Um, and uh, I might tell you that one of the reasons why this meeting has come about is again based on personal relations. Um, uh, our earlier ambassador to uh, Washington, Ali Siddiqui, uh, knows uh, President Trump's son-in-law, uh, Mr. Kushner, who's been taking some diplomatic initiatives in Saudi Arabia, in Russia and elsewhere. And he's uh, got hold of him to, to stiff for this initiative. And uh, so therefore, so Imran Khan concern. will have to charm President Trump. And President Trump being a hard man, I don't think he gets charmed very easily. Uh, but he is a man with a lot of ego. And if he can massage his ego, um, he <laughs> may just get the President to believe him that yes, Pakistan will help them find a solution. And in the meanwhile, America needs to restrain India so that India doesn't start uh, fingering Pakistan as it were. Uh, and, and compelling Pakistan to divert attention from the main focus of its efforts in Afghanistan to its eastern uh, border with India. And I think uh, <clears throat> the question of trade will come up, um, the question of Kashmir will come up. These are just points to be made. Um, Trump is not going to respond to them. Uh, these are just uh, brownie points. <clears throat> the real issue is the assurances by the Pakistanis that we are now looking towards the West. We don't want to get dragged into your conflict with India, uh, with, with, with China. Uh, uh, we all our eggs are not in the Chinese basket. Uh, we are turning to you for IMF, we are turning to you for FATF. We are deadly serious. We are abandoning jihad against India. We are going to push the Taliban into a, giving you a good exit strategy. So what more do you want from us? Uh, we are the good guys now. We may have been the bad guys, but we are the good guys now. We changed people. Now. And I think uh, there will be a pitch made also that uh, the person responsible for this 180-degree turn is none other than the one and only General Bajwa. 
and I, I dare say um, um, some of the credit will have to go there as well. Which is to say um, that the Americans may look kindly upon uh, the person of the Pakistani army chief um, and his requirements for continuity. Talking about uh, Afghanistan peace, um, uh, what U.S. Special Peace Envoy for Afghanistan Zalmay Khalil Zad is saying, let's hear that. We have made uh, substantive progress on all four elements and that make the framework that we have agreed to for a peace agreement, which is, uh, as you know, uh, assurances on counterterrorism that's important for the United States and the world, uh, withdrawal of uh, foreign troops, which is important for the Taliban, uh, inter-Afghan negotiations, including a dialogue uh, and an agreement on a roadmap for the political future of Afghanistan and a complete, comprehensive, a permanent ceasefire. Uh, Mr. Zilme Khalilzad is talking about the final settlement in peace in Afghanistan and he's talking about the country. So uh, do you think that Pakistan will come out uh, uh, in the flying colors out of this and will get achieve something out of this? Well, you know, um, uh, Khalilzad has been positive throughout his uh, diplomatic journeys. And now for the first time, the Pakistanis are being positive. Uh, the good vibes coming from all quarters including from the Taliban representatives in Doha. Um, the Burban meeting that took place, uh, the intra-Afghan dialogue which Pakistan hosted, the meeting in Beijing where, which Pakistan, Russia, America and China uh, discussed Afghanistan and the region. Pakistan was invited, India was not invited. These are big steps. And um, it appears as though China is now going to play an important role in, in finding a solution for America. But that will not just be a solution for America. The American solution is two things, basically. Number one, make sure that Afghanistan doesn't become a haven for terrorists who might do things against the West in general, and America in particular. No more Osama bin Ladens and no more terrorists, okay? Give us assurances. Second, allow us to leave Afghanistan in a dignified and honorable manner so, we, so that no one can say to us we were defeated in Afghanistan. President Trump has already made a commitment to his own people that he will pull American forces out. out from but he will not leave Afghanistan in the lurch so that it resorts, it becomes a haven of terrorists all over again. That those are the two things uh, America wants. China wants something as well. China wants to be part of the game that is now unfolding, which is for the future. Uh, the game for the future is raw materials, trade routes, access, markets. Okay, China wants to be part of that action because it's closer, it's on the scene, it's already made some investments there, it's interested in mining and of course it wants safety for its uh, road and belt initiative of which CPEC is an integral element. So China has a strong interest. Pakistan's interest is that Afghanistan should not be anti-Pakistan and pro-India and if there is an Afghan, intra-Afghan dialogue in which the Taliban have a central role, if not a, a monopolistic role, that will suit Pakistan admirably because then the others will not try to destabilize the situation. And the Taliban, as you know, are pro-Pakistan. They are not anti-Pakistan. They always were pro-Pakistan and they remain pro-Pakistan because we helped them in the last 20 years. Uh, so we have some leverage over them. Pakistan, of course, will be expecting that India will have no more role to play there. That may be a little difficult, although there are some people who say that India has lost all initiative and all uh, enterprise in Afghanistan. I don't believe that. Uh, the Northern Alliance and the non-Pashtuns are still very pro-India and very anti-Pakistan. Um, and uh, so we have to wait and see how that turns out. Um, Iran has a role um, and so on. Russia has a role. Russia doesn't want uh, Russian and um, Kyrgyz and other terrorists hanging around with bases in Afghanistan. Uh, so it also has an interest. So all these countries are now trying to affect a situation, an arrangement where their interests can be uh, protected res uh, respectively, in which there is peace and stability. Because without peace and stability and if there's conflict again, then everything will go helter-skelter again. So that is what they're trying to aim at by September, October of this year, uh, when the presidential elections are scheduled to be held. My sense is the optimism is, there's too much optimism that they'll get a deal. That's my sense. I think there's uh, many a slip between the cup and lip. I think there's a lot of uh, 
um, uh, uh, vested interests that are not interested in a long term peace settlement uh, which is pro Taliban. I think uh, there are a lot of interests that don't want the Americans to leave. Uh, they want American money and American support for the Afghan military. So there will be hitches and I am not sure that they will come to an agreement that will be stable and enduring. They may announce something in September, October, but then November, December things may go awry again. Uh, I don't think there will be uh, um, uh, the sort of settlement the Americans want. I don't think they'll get that. They will have to uh, retreat in a bit of a uh, hurry um, or they will have to stay there. Uh, at the very least, they will have to keep putting in seven to eight billion dollars a year. Uh, um, so it's still work in progress. I don't expect such great thundering positive news by September. Uh, there may be some movement, but to think that by September, October, the road will be clear uh, and everybody will be happy and it will be all hunky dory and uh, the elections will take place. There will be a constitution where everybody agrees and the Taliban and everybody else will start sharing power uh, and all that will happen in the next six months. I don't think so. Thank you very much, Arisha. That is all we have from London Studios. Uh, we'll meet again next week. Please do send us your feedback. Goodbye for now.